All right, we're going to start with our, our second panel today, and uh, this is views from the federal public defenders. Uh, we have as our committee members uh, Mr. Chip Frensley, <coughs> Ms. Catherine Rowe, Dr. Robert Rucker, and uh, the Honorable uh, Reggie Walton, and our panel participants, Ms. Maureen Franco, the federal public defender from the Western District of Texas, Ms. Virginia Brady, the federal public defender from the District of Colorado and Wyoming, Jason Hawkins, from the, a, the federal public defender from the Northern District of Texas, and Stephen McHugh, the federal public defender from the District of New Mexico. Uh, with that, uh, we'll start with opening statements, and we'll start with the Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you, um, fellow or, uh, committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to be heard regarding this important issue. Um, I am the federal defender for the Western District of Texas. Uh, it's one of the largest defender organizations in the country, covering 92,000 square miles. We uh, it, two time zones, which is interesting, and all, uh, especially when trying to organize conference calls with uh, various people in the offices. And we are one of the busiest districts, both in total caseload and um, caseload, average caseload per attorney. Fiscal year 2014, we opened 6,785 cases and closed 7,163 cases. In 2015 fiscal year, we opened 8,275 cases and we closed 7,388 cases. These are raw case numbers. In the entire district, um, if you exclude the petty offenses that are handled in the Del Rio Division, known as um, Operation Streamline, which are petty immigration offenses, we um, handled 40, in 2014, we handled 45.54% of all the criminal appointments. And last year, we um, handled 59.29% uh, of all criminal appointments in our, in our district. Um, I, there are several issues that obviously the 14 that the, the committee has identified as being of importance, um, but due to time and, and peculiarity to our district, um, I wanted to address um, a, a few of them. One is the judicial involvement in the selection and compensation of federal defenders and the independence of the federal defender organization. Um, I was selected by the director of the AO to participate as a steering committee member on the work measurement study initiated by the Judicial Resource Council. As a result of this extremely collaborative and comprehensive study, it was shown that the Western District of Texas lacked the necessary personnel to handle its caseload. In fact, <clears throat> the formula generated uh, by the Office of Personnel Management recommended that our office receive in excess of an additional 25 full-time equivalent employees. Of uh, the 25 new positions our office was awarded, at this time, I cannot add any new attorneys. I have, uh, I'm circuit capped at 50 attorneys, including myself. I have 49 on board right now. Um, I have reached out as well as um, uh, Margie Myers from the Southern District of Texas to the circuit to request um, that they follow the work measurement formula that has passed all vetting from the Judicial Resource Council through the Executive Committee, the Budget Committee, and um, in September, the, ju the Judicial Conference adopted it. And at this point in time, uh, we have not received any news uh, whatsoever whether or not the circuit will consider rising our cap. Um, I think based upon the, the large workload that we have historically had in the, in the Western District of Texas and in the Fifth Circuit altogether, that it seems incongruous that the circuit wouldn't immediately act to award us additional attorney positions uh, so that our office could continue to handle the cases that we've been appointed to and also um, to address an issue which the court identified in its previous um, um, panel discussion, which is on the capital habeas um, cases, has been extremely difficult um, for when the cases arose in the Western District of Texas to find qualified counsel within the Western District to handle those cases. Um, there, I believe that there is a strong need in the Fifth Circuit for if we don't call it a capital habeas unit, if we just could get our cap uh, raised so that we could add attorney positions within our office, then we could address that need that is um, very, very evident within the Western District of Texas and certainly within the entire Fifth Circuit. Um, another issue I think that is important is on the judicial involvement in the appointment and compensation <clears throat> and management of panel attorneys and investigators, experts, and other services. Um, as uh, obviously we're a border di uh, district and we carry a heavy immigration load, when appropriate, our attorneys and investigators pursue U.S. citizenship claims in defense to illegal reentry charges. 
successful citizenship claims happen often enough in our district that no reentry case can be called routine anymore. Each must involve at least a preliminary inquiry into whether under a complex statutory scheme and often complex family histories, the defendant might be a citizen. This type, is this the type of investigation and review possible for a court appointed attorney who is not within a defender's office? Do they have the expertise to be able to make a determination as to whether or not a derivative claim should and can be pursued? Will the judge in charge of the case appoint an investigator knowledgeable in this area, which is highly specialized, upon request of the court appointed attorney? Will the court pay for the time spent researching a possible derivative claim? The questions presented above and here um, before the committee are just a few of the areas of concern the commission should examine and study. It is important to note that we assist all non-U.S. citizens who could claim derivative citizenship, regardless of what brought them into federal custody, as we believe it's ancillary to our appointment. Do other court-appointed attorneys have the ability to do the same? We have a high percentage of Spanish-speaking defendants because many of our cases involve immigration and drug violations, a high pretrial detention rate. To see clients or interview witnesses, attorneys and investigators frequently must travel distances of up to 270 miles round trip. Court-appointed counsel has the same issue when appointed to a case within our district. The remote detention issue within our district complicates and exacerbates the issues of finding and retaining qualified court-appointed counsel to handle these cases and to get compensated for meeting the requirements of the Sixth Amendment. The remoteness and vastness of the Western District of Texas, along with judicial involvement in the appointment, compensation, and management of panel attorneys, similarly complicates the ability to recruit and retain qualified court-appointed counsel to serve on divisional panels of eligible attorneys available for court appointments. For example, although many efforts have been made to establish a panel of, uh, of attorneys in the Austin Division available for court-appointed cases, no such uh, formal panel exists within that division. The Alpine Pecos Division and the Del Rio Division are handicapped in effort, efforts to recruit and retain qualified court-appointed counsel based upon the rural nature of the, uh, these locales and the sheer lack of interested qualified attorneys to take on court-appointed work. The additional issue of judicial involvement in assessing the need for the number and duration of remote jail client visits further exacerbates an effort to recruit and retain qualified court-appointed attorneys in these underserved areas. Um, I've already mentioned the, the problems that, um, in the capital habeas cases. The other um, issue that we have identified is um, in our district is that it is very difficult in multi-defendant cases to find, especially in certain divisions, qualified counsel to be appointed. Um, our office very often is conflicted out of a case because perhaps we represented a cooperator before, or we only in, uh, can receive one of the cases, and so thus the court has to go to the panel attorneys for, um, for these type of appointments. In our larger cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, they do have panel attorneys, the panels that are broken down as far as complex or the A panel versus the B panel. But in Austin, for instance, where we don't have a panel, where we have to rely on the court has appointed in the past and trying to pull those people in, it's very difficult. And I've mentioned the remoteness of the, um, of the Del Rio division and also the Pecos and Alpine division. For me, as the, as the head of the of NITOAD, which stands for the National IT the applications, operations applications uh, division uh, for the Defender IT system. Uh, this, what has happened, what did happen with the consolidation of the IT has become especially troublesome and really needs to be addressed immediately. Um, it's, um, it's very difficult to try to, at first, to explain how this could have happened. Um, our, our IT system was separate from the AO's IT function. Um, Defender Services managed our IT. The NITO division had all, they are all Western District of Texas employees. They work for me. I'm the appointing authority. I'm also the firing authority. Um, and uh, when the AO decided to consolidate based up for cost reasons, they decided they were going to take over our, our IT um, system. Since they merged, they moved the, de the <clears throat> Defender Services IT into the AO. 
This created a very difficult situation, if not an, a, an ethical situation. And it was only with uh, the intense involvement, which we are very appreciative of the NACDL, that issued an ethics opinion that, that set out that it was um, unethical for a defender office and defender employee, a defender lawyer, to be part of a system where our, act, our data could be accessed by third parties that we were able to enter into memoranda of understandings between the Defender Services Organization and the um, national IT on the AO front. Um, that I would say, though, that all the, these memoranda of understanding um, between the parties exist. Um, defenders continue to be concerned with the AO's access to client information, and we should be concerned. Although management at the AO and within the technological department continue to make assurances that our confidential information will not be assessed, such reassurances are not comforting when the individuals in charge do not understand the reason for confidentiality. For example, one AO IT manager at the highest um, level explained that he had top secret clearance and thus we defenders should not be concerned if he had access to our data. He did not understand that having access to our data when he is not a defender employee violates the duty of confidentiality owed to our clients. Another um, a AOIT manager wanted to access our protected case management system known as defender data in order to test applications within that protected realm, not realizing that allowing her through the firewall would jeopardize thousands of clients' confidential data and information. So to sum um, up, I would say that um, this need for the study is, is overdue, that um, sequestration brought this to the, the front burner. Um, it is a pressing concern, and I, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the issue of the independence of our IT function is of extreme importance. Thank you. All right. Um, if we could hear now from Ms. Grady. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and uh, it's great to have you all here, too, um, asking these uh, tough questions. Um, I'm going to pick up um, in my prepared comments from where the committee left off with Ms. Otto, and particularly the, com the, um, the, the, the subject of um, uh, independence, what that means now, today, as opposed to 20 years ago, and also the um, subject of parity, which uh, has, I think, been... Um, uh, discussed a little bit, and I think we need to discuss more here. Um, since the inception of the Criminal Justice Act, Congress wrestled with the question of where the administrative offices of the United States Courts and the, uh, I'm sorry, of the Federal Defender Organization should be placed within our branches of government. It was essential to honor professional distance between appointed defense counsel and the court, just as there is professional distance between prosecutors and the court. In fact, the initial placement of defender services within the judiciary was considered temporary. Until Congress could settle on a permanent placement, it cautioned that the need for a strong, independent, administrative leadership be the subject of continuing review until the time is right to take this next step. The Prado Committee was tasked with that review 21 years later. Since release of the committee's report, our community has worked diligently to perform our public defense function within the judicial branch while maintaining the same professional distance afforded privately retained or prosecution counsel. In recent years, with the federal budgetary crisis affecting the judiciary at large, the defender community has faced the challenging task of responsibly performing the constitutionally mandated federal defense function with increasingly scarce resources. Now we are working within a sophisticated funding formula following the great success of our cooperative work measurement study, which recognized that federal indigent defense must be adequately funded. Drawing from this data-driven context, I hope that the review of this committee will be able to focus more broadly on the characteristics of our individual practices, shared and unique, that drive our resource demands. So, I will turn to Colorado and Wyoming and our three immutable resource demands, geography, weather, and time. The District of Wyoming covers more than 97,000 square miles. It is served by two major interstate highways uh, running both east-west and north-south. I-80 uh, is a major national uh, trucking thoroughfare, and during Wyoming winters, one of the country's most dangerous. 
we have one office in Wyoming. It is located in Cheyenne in the state's far southeastern corner. Thank you for putting up with my map. Our yeah. lawyers and our investigators spend many hours navigating the treacherous I-80. The United States District Court for the District of Wyoming sits in Cheyenne, Casper, Mammoth, and Jackson. Jackson. Uh, the Wyoming United States Attorney's Office is headquartered in Cheyenne and has branches in Casper, Mammoth, and Lander. But the criminal docket is largely limited to Casper and Cheyenne. We have three assistant federal public defenders assigned to our Wyoming branch. In fiscal 2014, five of our seven jury trials were held in Casper. Casper is 179 miles one way from our Cheyenne office. With no office in Casper, our attorneys have always staged their litigation out of their hotel rooms. There are no federally owned detention facilities in Wyoming. And let me just say, none of the counties want us. Most of our clients are detained in the state of Nebraska, Scotts Bluff County, on the other, just on the other side of the border. Scotts Bluff is about a two-hour drive from our Cheyenne office. The rest of our Wyoming detained clients are scattered in county jails across the state. Uh, I should add that none of those county jails, with the exception of one, want to have a contract with the United States Marshal Service. The Wind River Indian Reservation occupies a 2.2 million acre swath of land in the middle of the state. Two tribes, the Eastern Shoshone and the Northern Arapaho, reside in Wind River. There are approximately 14,000 enrolled tribal members, tribal members, most of whom live within the boundaries of the reservation. The crime rate on the Wind River Reservation has historically been five to seven times the national average. Many serious violent felonies arise there. These cases require on-site investigation by our attorneys and our investigator. Wind River is close to Lander, where the United States Attorney has a branch office. Wind River is geographically isolated, and it is truly cut off from access to justice. From our office in Cheyenne, it's 306 miles, a seven-hour drive. There's a courtroom in nearby Lander, but we don't use it anymore because they can't manage having anyone detained because all they have is a cage that will hold one person. Most of the Wind River cases are heard in Casper. So the deplorable detention options in Wyoming really hurt the Native Americans the hardest. Most are either housed about an hour uh, from the reservation in a county jail that restricts all of the federal inmates to 23 hours segregated lockdown or the alternative in Scotts Bluff County in Nebraska. Wind River is a very poor community and many of us residents, residents do not have the means to travel off of the reservation at all. The CJA panel in Wyoming is very small. Most of the attorneys have very small practices and they reside in the Cheyenne area. All must deal with the same travel problems that the attorneys and investigator in my office face. In Colorado, our resource demands are similarly driven by distance and geography. The, distant, the district encompasses more than 100,000 square miles and supports the largest population of any judicial district in the Tenth Circuit. Federal lands comprise about one-third of the state, including four national parks, five national monuments, and 12 national, 12 national forests. Colorado also has several military in, uh, installations. The Bureau of Prisons has a significant presence in the District of Colorado. The complex in Florence includes the, the country's highest security prison, Supermax. It has a USP, an FCI, and a camp. The Florence complex is located in desolate country, uh, two and a half uh, hours southwest of Denver. Our clients who are charged with committing crimes in the Florence system we now remain detained there during the life of the case. That means that we have to go there to see them. The only way to get to Florence is to drive the remote secondary highways. Client visits require advance appointments that are frequently thwarted by long waits and last minute shutdowns within the prison complex. And as you might imagine, the prison cases produce conflicts of interest and frequently require appointment of counsel and the same demands of the Criminal Justice Act panel attorneys. In recent years, the United States Attorney has had two assistants dedicated to prosecuting cases that occur in Florence. There's also an FCI, a camp, and a detention center just outside of Denver. All of our prison pros prosecutions are on the rise. 
Colorado is also home to two Indian, res Indian nations in the Four Corners region of the state. The Southern Ute tribe headquartered in Ignacio is uh, an hour, a half hour drive southeast of Durango, southwestern uh, corner of the state. And the neighbor, uh, neighboring Ute Mountain Ute, Indi uh, Ute Mountain Ute Indian tribe is about an hour drive west of Durango. Uh, historically, all federal criminal cases arising in southwestern Colorado were transferred immediately to federal court in Denver along with any detained clients. But in the last two years, the district has implemented an access to justice initiative to bring the court to the people on the western side of the state. So every other month, a designated district judge holds a formal term of court in Durango and a formal term of court in the city of Grand Junction. The United States Attorney's Office has full-time assistants staffed in both locations. Prosecutions tied to these locations now largely remain there. And as a result, the lawyers in my office are spending an unprecedented amount of time on the road. The Rocky Mountains and the Continental Divide sit between our office in downtown Denver and these remote court programs. That may be stating the obvious to everyone here in this room, but I, we have had visitors from Washington who have shown up with snippets of uh, maps taken off of Google and have not recognized the topography between um, the west eastern half of the state and the western half of the state. And that's important because the door-to-door -door drive from our office to Grand Junction is basically four hours whether you go on a plane or whether you get in the car and drive there. It's longer if you try to drive to, uh, to Steamboat, I mean to, uh, to Durango, but I don't like our lawyers to do that because it's a dangerous drive. Some clients designated to the Grand Junction docket are being held in Park County Jail, which is two hours from Denver and about four hours in all high country roads from Grand Junction. Uh, our locally detained clients are also scattered all about the Front Range in about six or seven different jails. Our office in Denver also maintains an established appellate section that takes cold record appeals from all over the Tenth Circuit. Our appellate practice is quite varied and complex. We work very closely with the um, members of the panel um, in the Tenth Circuit, particularly those who, are, um, who reside locally. Uh, we also have, since 2009, had two appellate positions that are occupied by attorneys who have special expertise in capital habeas appeals. Uh, since we began this practice, the attorneys who have occupied these positions have largely represented defendants from Oklahoma's death row. We do not have a CHU, and our work is limited to the appeal, but uh, as you know, death cases at any stage of the litigation are professionally taxing. The attorneys in our office have all contributed to training uh, the Colorado and Wyoming panel attorneys through a program that I started 15 years ago. Um, because I'm not sure whether you're going to hear from panel attorneys from uh, Colorado or Wyoming, uh, I want to speak specifically on their behalf. Most of these people are solo practitioners. They have little or no staff. They answer their own phones. Some of them just rent airspace. They keep their overhead low. They contract out for everything. Most don't have access to paralegals with expertise managing big discovery cases. We've heard about e-discovery that the U.S. Attorney's Office is using where you download discovery from a cloud. A lot of the panel attorneys don't know what a cloud is. That's because they're doing everything themselves, not because they're technologically deficient. Uh, they do their own billing, and when a solo practitioner must spend a day traveling to review discovery, uh, to see a client uh, far away with a detain who's detained, she leaves an empty office. Um, I tell you this because when you hear, as you have, testimony about voucher cutting uh, from and reject, rejected um, requests for um, in, uh, investigators or experts, um, any other kind of outside help the panel attorneys may need, please understand that this is the landscape from which they work. They are very proud of their solo practices, and they largely don't raise that flag when they're asking the court to fund outside expertise. Panel attorneys are a critical component of our hybrid system, and without them, the Criminal Justice Act would not reach all of the people it is intended to serve. Next week marks my 25th year as a federal public defender. Our organization has grown up since the days when I started. 
We have indeed become, as Judge Saras uh, once wrote about 10 or 11 years ago, the flagship of the Criminal Justice Act, and we are now equipped with a formidable financial management tool to remain responsible stewards. The committee's view of our future should be at least as long as our past. Your view of our future should be seen through the lens of preserving not only our financial parity, I'm not really sure how we do that, but also our functional parity, which I think is very important and something of an elephant in the room here. So to echo Judge Saris' words in 2004, our top priority must be to maintain the integrity of the Federal Defender Organization. Thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Good afternoon, and I want to uh, tell you it's an honor and privilege to be here before you, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to lend my testimony as you examine the Criminal Justice Act. I began my career in public service um, as a federal public defender in 1999. I was an assistant federal public defender in the Capitol <coughs> Habeas Unit of the District of Arizona. In 2001, I transferred from that unit back to my home state of Texas, and I've been in the Federal Public Defender's Office from the Northern District of Texas since that time in various roles, including as a, a trial attorney and an appellate attorney. Throughout these last 17 years, I've experienced both the exhilarating highs and the lows of the job. I've had the opportunity to argue before the Supreme Court of the United States. I've also had the traumatic experience of watching my client, Anthony Lee Cheney, be executed in the Arizona Lethal Injection Chamber. I've dedicated my legal career to the fundamental principle announced in the Gideon that the citizen accused deserves equal access to justice under the law, regardless of their financial circumstances. And since the initial passage of that act in 1964, I generally believe the act has accomplished its mission in providing the indigent charged with a crime in federal court with quality counsel through a robust mix of federal defenders and Criminal Justice Act panel attorneys, members of the private bar. One could simply not exist without the other. In recent years, however, I've questioned whether the Criminal Justice Act and its funding has kept up with the times. At its inception, only 30% of all federal defendants qualified for appointed counsel, but today that figure stands at 90%. Uh, the number of cases that counsel were initially appointed to at the inception of, uh, of the act was approximately 10,000 cases. And today that number stands between 210,000 and 230,000 annually. Within the Northern District of Texas, I've seen federal prosecutions in increase dramatically over these last six years. Just six years ago, using the weighted caseload uh, metric, the new metric devised by the Administrative Office of the Courts, our caseload was at approximately 2,400 weighted cases. Today, it stands at approximately 3,200 weighted cases. Through this period, I've been allowed minimal increases in my staff because that's uh, now a decision controlled by the AO. And whether or not those uh, staff members are allowed to be attorneys, is now tightly, is, has always been tightly controlled by the Fifth Circuit. As the numbers have grown um, with little allowed growth in my staff, frankly, we've struggled to keep up. In 2013, when sequestration budget cuts hit, it nearly devastated my office. In my opinion, some of the policymakers from the AO made decisions that were designed to benefit the judicial branch at large of the Defender Services Program and the clients that my office and the CJA panel lawyers represent. My office has only begun to recover from the five employees that I lost during the time of sequestration and the 15 days of unpaid furloughs that were endured. While I do not know what the future of the Criminal Justice Act holds, I think that any serious review of the act must consider whether Defender Services Program should be independent of the judicial branch. Thank you. And uh, finally, Mr. McHugh. Uh, thank you, Judge, and I'd also like to welcome you to New Mexico, uh, where the sun shines 320 days a year, <laughs> all evidence to the contrary notwithstanding. Um, I will spare you the uh, reading of my written testimony, although I commend it to you if it's late at night and sleep evades you. Um, I'd just like to hit a, a couple of high points. I mean, we share, um, we're an interesting district in that we share um, problems uh, the problems of geography and distance uh, with Colorado. Uh, we're the, the fifth largest state in the Union. We have a very small population. We have 22 Indian nations that are spread out uh, throughout the northern portions of the state. 
We also um, share uh, a border with Mexico, so we have the same problems as Ms. Franco's office. We have an overwhelming uh, immigration docket in the southern part of the state. And uh, even though we do a lot of reentry cases, there's nothing perfunctory about those cases. They're all individuals. They're all human beings. Um, they all need individual attention and individual investigation. We have a fast track program down there so that the cases move quickly, um, which is, I think, very much to the credit of the court. They don't want to see people spending any more time in, in jail than they have to, but it's tough on the lawyers. Uh, puts a lot of pressure on, on our lawyers and on the CJA panel down there um, to move those cases quickly. Uh, we do about uh, statewide about 55% of the cases. I have the statistics here just for uh, FY15, which just finished at the end of September in, in um, Las Cruces and in Albuquerque, we, we uh, took 55% of the appointments in each division of the court. Uh, I'd just like to, to hit a couple of high points. I mean, first of all, I think that the federal judiciary did assume a fiduciary duty to look after the independence of the defense function um, when Defender Services was put into um, the administrative office of the court. And, and they uh, did that initially by setting up a structure, uh, a separate appropriation for Defender Services, a separate directorate, uh, within um, the AO uh, for Defender Services Matters. And uh, with the, the budget Armageddon that we've all experienced the last few years, I think there's been a scarcity mentality that has set in in the judiciary, and I think a lot of those protections have been eroded. And, um, you know, when the structure is changed, as it has been for Defender Services, then uh, I think you're headed for trouble because um, despite the, the best intentions uh, of the judges who are currently on some of the committees, um, federal judges are a mixed bag. I mean, they're, they're, they come with a lot of different experiences. A lot of them uh, mostly have civil experience. Um, a lot of prosecutors end up on the federal bench. And um, there are some folks who are just not as committed to the independence of the defense function as perhaps they, they should be. They see us as a, a competition for the budget. I mean, there's this notion that every dime a defender gets is a dime the judiciary doesn't get. And, and while I don't think technically that's true, uh, I think it's a, a, um, a common sentiment uh, in the judiciary. Um, I, I think that the, 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 uh, the CJA panel and the CJA lawyers are really kind of the, the canary in the mine. And I think the fact that they have suffered um, problems with voucher cutting and um, with voucher review is a real warning sign that, that should, must be heeded uh, by this committee. Um, my own view is that the, the fact that judges are reviewing vouchers is really anachronistic. Uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s when the CJA was established, there really wasn't anyone else to perform that function. Judges were already um, setting fees in civil cases in some instances, and so um, that job fell to the judges. But now we have federal defenders. Uh, federal defenders serve, I think, 91 of the 94 districts nationally. Um, and we are, as every study has shown, we're, we're fiscally well-managed, we're responsible managers, we're federal certifying officers, and so I think that um, the task of reviewing vouchers should be taken from the judges uh, and given to defenders. And I'd just like to say that it's not something I'm sure Maureen shares my concern about this. Um, last year in F FY15, we had uh, 2,800 CJA <coughs> appointments in this district. I already have a job. You know, I already have two jobs. I have a caseload. I run an office. I work with our CJA panel. Um, I don't really need to be reviewing 2,800 vouchers, but I think we should. I think that that, that function should be shifted um, to federal defenders. Um, and that's all I have for my opening statement. Thank you. All right. We'll start with questioning and Dr. Rucker. Uh, one of the things that struck me that uh, a lot of you talked about are resources and the sort of scarcity of resources that you experience with sequestration and and a little bit of positive view uh, because of the work measurement formula. Uh, but I'm struck that you don't have the resources now, even though the work measurement formula seems to say that you should have a lot more positions that you than you currently have. Uh, should we take that away from the courts as well? Should we take the appointments of the federal defenders away from the courts? I'd like to hear what all of you think about that. And do you have the adequate resources that you need to do a lot of these things? If I could go first, I, I think it should be taken away from the judiciary. I think that when um, the work measurement was certainly crammed down our throats, um, we have always worked 
uh, as a lean and mean machine, I think nationally as a program, and the work measurement certainly bared that out. Um, but we, um, as being a steering committee member and joining in on it, and it was, as I mentioned before, very collaborative and cooperative with, um, with Harvey Jones with the Office of Personal Management, it became very apparent that the Fifth Circuit is sorely lacking um, in resources um, from any of the other districts um, throughout the country, uh, circuits throughout the country that we could compare ourselves to. We are under, we are under resourced, underfunded, and it has been purposely done that way. For what reason, I'm not sure, maybe for historical reasons, um, but in any case, um, this has been fully vetted. It has gone through every single uh, committee you can think of, everyone without any much debate, uh, agreed with that this funding formula was appropriate and that I should be getting more lawyers. And as I mentioned um, in my statement and also in my written letter, maybe, maybe the circuit will consider it in May. I'm hoping that they will consider it in January, but I think it's not likely. And um, I think that it is... Um, it highlights the problem with putting that much power in the circuit, um, that the work should, the personnel, the resources should go where the work is. Um, the Western District of Texas and the Southern District of Texas are two of the very busiest districts along with Arizona and um, Rubens District in Southern California. Um, and for us to be um, held back the way that we've been held back is um, unacceptable. And I think that um, the circuit should be removed from that function. I'd like to say that um, uh, we're in the land of milk and honey in the Tenth Circuit. I mean, we're very fortunate. Our new chief judge is Judge Timkovich, who was involved in all the studies and, and is aware, and I don't anticipate any problems. We came out of the study plus 14, and I don't anticipate problems. But I think the fact that, that you're hearing that our neighbors to the south in El Paso and in other districts are having problems means that, again, the structure needs to be addressed. Uh, because it's, it's implemented by individuals, and, and they just happen to have um, folks in charge down in the Fifth Circuit who have a very different view um, of how things should be should be running. I, I would just uh, echo Maureen's comments. I mean, I, I think that she's correct. I think it needs to be taken away from them. Why, why the staffing is so different in the Fifth Circuit is something I, I do not understand. Um, when I compare ourselves with other circuits, we do very similar work. Um, and yet the, the circuit, um, it has been difficult to get resources from the circuit. So um, the AO put together this formula that, that says currently that I was supposed to get, you know, one more employee with my current caseload as, as it stands just pat right now. Um, I should get eight more employees over the, over the next two years. But certainly there have been initial indications from the circuit that it's going to take perhaps more of this formula to get those employees uh, put in my office. So, <clears throat> as the newest appointee here, you would, that's why I'm going last to answer your question. But um, I, I will echo what um, Steve said about uh, the Tenth Circuit being the land of milk and honey. We have a wonderful relationship with our circuit, and we always have. Um, I, I did want to, though, your question, though, made me recall um, something I read in preparing for today's testimony, which I think, if I'm uh, recalling accurately, was the testimony by Attorney General Kennedy when the act it was originally presented to Congress in 1964. And at that time, he addressed um, why it was that the, um, maybe, uh, maybe it was, maybe it was, it was later, but why it was that the um, the circuit must have been later, 1970. Why it was that the circuit would be appointing the um, federal public defender as opposed to the district judges, and the answer was because they uh, the intent was to keep the district court judges from being too connected to what it was and having too much in, to uh, prevent district court judges from in. Uh, considering themselves to have too much of a role in the management of their of the federal defender offices. I mean, we talk about each other, our, our district judges, in terms of ownership, my, just my chief judge and my defender. Um, and I think that the notion at the time was to create a little bit more distance um, when the defender organization was, um, was uh, created in 1970. But um, the, your other question was, why are we so scarcely 
why do we not have enough staff right now? And um, for those of us who were, who did benefit from the work measurement study um, and our new funding formulas, the answer is it's taking time to staff up. Um, it's just taking time. And, uh, but what I don't know, I think everyone's situation is different. I can only speak for our situation. Uh, but as we are trying to staff up, our demands are changing in our front yard. And so all of a sudden, you know, in the last six or eight months, um, our lawyers are going all over the district in a way, in both districts, in a way that they never have before. So we're still chasing the concept of being fully staffed. And I don't know if we're even going to get there in given what we've been given with the um, results of work measurement. But that's the nature of the beast, is that we are a reactive um, uh, organization. It was a reactive business. And the one part of this model that we can't do anything about are the numbers that come out of the U.S. attorney's offices. In some districts, those num like mine, those numbers are going up a little bit. In other districts, they're going down. Can I follow up? Because there's a difference between appointing the actual federal public defender and then the circuit having control over who you hire and how many people you hire. Um, so in follow-up to D Dr. Rucker's uh, question, any, any thoughts about those differences? In other words, each of you were appointed by your circuit, right? Um, do you see a problem with that as opposed to the circuit managing how you run your office? I just get reappointed for the fourth time, so I think it works great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fifth time, fifth time, um, I, I think that's that's an interesting, um, perhaps breaking point. That you know maybe it is appropriate for the, the judges, the, the circuit judges, to, to pick the heads of the offices. But beyond that, you know we we have um, structure through Defender Services Office. I mean they, you know, we report everything about our budget to them monthly in terms of staffing and. and caseload and how things are going and they're very much aware of what the trends are and so I think they're perhaps in a, a much better position um, than circuit judges who um, you know have plenty to do without delving that deeply into those kinds of into that kind of nitty-gritty about what resources offices need. I want to just follow up on Dr. Rucker's question and I'm um, thinking specifically more um, Ms. Franco and Mr. Hawkins to the Fifth Circuit. For the past year and a half to two years all the federal defenders and community defender offices throughout the U.S. have been focused on the work measurement study. And thousands and thousands of hours have gone into that study, kind of trying to perfect it to, to, to fit what we do, but also having all of our staff work um, to make sure that the data was correct. So all of your staff, obviously, were involved in that for the last year and a half to two years. And now you get your numbers and the work measurement study says for you, Ms. Franco, that you have, you should get 25 additional employees. And for you, Mr. Hawkins, another additional eight. And whether you agree with what the number is or not, um, the fact is, is that those metrics say that you're understaffed and have been understaffed for a very long time. And now we have the circuit saying, well, that, well, I don't even know if they say that may or may not be true. They say, okay, everyone in the judiciary has agreed, all the committees have agreed with this but we're not going to authorize staff, at least right away, maybe in the future, maybe a few at a time, whatever it happens to be. My question to you is more about your people, your personnel. After having participated in all this, thinking that they are in some way independent as defenders, what has been the effect on them and what has been the effect on your clients? It's a good question. Um, Everyone participated fully in the work measurement and understood the importance of it. And everyone in the office kept time from someone who answered the phone to myself. Everyone kept time for that period. Um, and um, all, our, our, all of us are invested in trying to staff up our office to recoup the losses from sequestration because we lost a lot of people, um, took early retirement. I think I added it up at one point in time in 100 years um, cumulative of, of legal experience of uh, federal criminal defense walked out the door as a result of sequestration. It's very difficult to come back from that. And so we're all committed to, to participating in this and to try to staff back up again. 
And um, I can hire uh, LRAs, the legal research and writing positions, but they can't go to court. So that um, doesn't help my trial attorneys very much when they have to go visit clients at remote jails. Um, and when they're in El Paso, for instance, when there's nine different courts that they could be in on one day. Um, so it, it is very demoralizing in a lot of ways that we participated fully. We got a study out that showed that we were understaffed, that we've done a Herculean job for the last um, 40 years that our, our office has been in existence. And then to basically have a big um, brick wall thrown up against us uh, to try to get through that is very difficult. Um, but I'm hopeful that if we just keep chipping away um, and getting the data to the circuit, that they will relinquish some of their resistance to give us the additional staffing. At, again, and just echoing what she said, I, I did think demoralizing is the appropriate word. Um, you know, the, the study was very transparent. Um, it came out and it showed us, it compared us to other offices around the country. Um, it showed us what the actual case numbers were. And so uh, my attorneys and staff saw that and, and asked me for an explanation. And I said, I, I don't really have an explanation. It's just how the Fifth Circuit has really controlled us. Um, but my hope is, um, much as in Maureen's, is as we get this information up to the Fifth Circuit, um, and, with the, and with the help of our local district judges, frankly, um, that that will aid us in chipping away and, and show what the impact of, of how they've controlled us, you know, for the past 20 years, what impact that's actually had on us and our ability to represent our clients. You may not want to answer this question, and I'd understand why, but is the attitude that exists that is limiting your ability to staff your offices the product of legitimate fiscal concern, indifference, or something sinister? I'm, I'm really, I, I don't know, Your Honor. That, that's a difficult, very difficult question for me to answer. Um, I, I will say, you know, um, for the first time in the last decade, uh, last year, I made a request to the, to the chief judge of the, new chief judge of the Fifth Circuit um, to add attorneys to my office, and, and that, that request was approved, was approved. And so, like I said, my hope is now that with this new data that's come out with the work measurement study, um, that that you know, gets into the, the judges on the Fifth Circuit's head and it, it'll have a better impact for us. But, um you don't mind me adding this to Jason, is that when Jason was able to get the four positions, um, basically the rest of us were told, don't come with your hat in your hand. Um, and that it wasn't, even though his numbers showed that his caseload had grown tremendously over the from his last request, which was what, 10 years prior to that? Yes. That um, it was not a pro forma decision, that it was a very contested and heated discussion regarding whether or not those four lawyers um, would be um, justified in his office. Now, that decision was made um, around sequestration. It was pre-work measurement um, and pre-approval of the work measurement formula. So perhaps um, that edification will improve the rest of us with our hats in our hand um, to get um, positions approved by the circuit. But as far as, I don't know, I don't think it's it's a nefarious reason for it. I think that um, I heard a quote earlier today about, you know, part of it should be your pro bono um, responsibility to do this type of work. And um, it sounded somewhat familiar to what I've heard. So I wonder if that came out of a Fifth Circuit opinion. But um, yeah, I think that there's a, that, that thinking out there too is that um, perhaps um, the bar should be doing more of these cases and, and not our office. I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't know if the data exists, but do you know if data does exist that shows a correlation between lack of resources and wrongful convictions as in, in say, you know, districts where you don't have what you need as compared to districts where they do get adequate resources. I'm sure there there are studies like that probably on the state level. I'm not aware of that on the federal level, but I know on the state level that they have done those type of studies to show that um, when public defenders are overtasked, overworked, that the wrongful conviction rate is quite a bit higher than in areas where it's, where it's not. How about the concept of dockets declining? I mean, you're, 
you are so much subject to dockets going up and down. Do you hear, uh, do you have a concern that they're going to say, well, Ms. Franco, um, Mr. Hawkins, what's the concern? You're, you know, our case, these caseloads in the circuit are going down. Well, that's an interesting point because when I was preparing my letter to the circuit to ask for new positions, I noticed that my two predecessors talked about really we should be asking for X, but we're only asking for Y because our doc, you know we're at subject to the whim of the immigration docket. Um, but as Jenny said, we're we're constantly playing catch up. So you know, even if we caught up to the docket as it stood right now, we would still be understaffed when you compare us to other dockets. I mean, to other. Uh, uh, districts throughout the country and certainly to other circuits throughout the country. So, um, and yes, they're declining, but the cases are becoming much more difficult. They're becoming much more selective on what cases they bring, and it's um, it's requiring much more involvement um, in attorney time and in investigator time and expert times. I mean, just driving up here, to, I got probably four or five requests for experts in various cases throughout the district. Um, and so our, the, the nature of our cases are changing. And, and as we all talked about, a 1326 case is not a simple 1326 case. From a derivative citizenship issue, which is very time intensive, to a crime of violence issue, which can be you know, maddening to try to figure that out and to litigate it and to present it properly to the court. So even if the number goes down, it just the work has not gone down. I can assure you that we're more busy now than we have been. Do any of you call for absolute autonomy from the judiciary? And if you do, do you share the concerns that some have expressed that you may not fare as well with absolute autonomy as compared to what you fare now? Just if I might respond, Judge, I, think, I, don't, I don't think we have unanimity in the defender community on that issue, on the independence issue. Um, I think even on this panel, we don't have unanimity. Um, there, there have been, there's been talk in the defender community that if we were independent, we might end up being the next Planned Parenthood. You know, that we're really one scandal or one horrible case away from, from being defunded. That said, um, we did pretty well during sequestration by you know, going to the Hill ourselves and um, asking for the funding that we needed because we felt that the judiciary wasn't taking our part and wasn't representing us well. And um, Congress, both in the House and the Senate, uh, was very receptive. Um, and I think they uh, appreciate the, the function that we have and the, the fact that the Sixth Amendment requires it and that um, their constituents um, appreciate having good representation. So I, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, personally, I don't, I don't see how we could really be independent unless if we're in, you know, we have a, a finite structure of government. There's the judiciary and the executive. And I, I, don't, I don't really see how that would work. I don't see a clear path to that. I mean, other people, I think, have um, thought it through more, more uh, completely than I have. But I think, uh, to me, I think that the structure, um, you know, reinvigorating and reinforcing the structure that we have within the judiciary um, would go a long way towards uh, updating the system. I mean, we have a system that's 50 years old, and the realities of the criminal justice system in this country have changed in the last 50 years, and, and we're dealing with a statute that's 50 years old. And so I think that's, you know, that's where we need to start. Well, how about a structure more like the Sentencing Commission? I think, I think that would be a, a good step in the right direction. I mean, people have said that the Sentencing Commission or the Federal Judicial Center you know, are both really sort of independent entities within the judiciary, and I think that's, you know, that would be a step in the right direction. But it's suffering. I mean, positions aren't being filled. And there's a lot of opposition to the Sentencing Commission on Capitol Hill. They like us. don't like some of their more recent policies. So. They like us better. <laughs> <laughs> At least this week. <laughs> that, that could all change. I mean, that, and, that's, and I think that's what holds back a lot of defenders from saying we should just get out. I think with that, we, we need to have some more independence. I don't know if we need complete independence. Um, but certainly with my um, role as being head of NITOAD and, and this, um, the AO taking over our IT system without a second thought about it, without any um, concern for the attorney-client privilege information and confidentiality, uh, was very troubling. Um, and it required a lot of pushback. And like I mentioned before, the, and only because, thank you, Chip, the NACDL um, issued an ethics opinion which back, based, backed up what we were saying. 
Um, so I think we need a national office. So the Defender Services Office, we need somebody like them. But I'm not so sure it belongs in the AO. Would be my we need to structure something where it's outside the AO. Theoretically, where? The, that's the question. I'm like Steve. I can't envision it. I know it has to be out there, and, and that we could uh, all of us working together to come up with something. But it's just the, the AO through sequestration, and then with this um, re, the reorganization that it did. Even when it took its, um, you know, I know that was the um, the executive committee. I think that took away the um, the uh, jurisdictional issue for the Defender Services Committee. A lot of these things that happen, it just you scratch your head and and say why and the ability to do that seems very inappropriate but um, we, I am worried about us becoming the next Planned Parenthood but the system that we have right now is not functional for the legal services corporation. right you know if I if I could just chime in here on this um, subject I think it's premature for a lot of us to weigh in on that ultimate question but I also um, expect that when the committee is done with the tour and talking to all the defenders and the um, panel attorneys and judges that you'll have a better idea of where lines should be drawn in the sand. Uh, and we certainly have a couple of top you know, lines in the sands on our list that should be drawn, such as um, uh, IT. But um, I think that there's there may be other you know areas. How, maybe the, the what the committee decides after um, its review is something that no one's thought of before, but that's the whole purpose of having all of these conversations, and we'd like to be as much engaged in that, all of the defenders, I'm sure, as possible, so that those of us who are don't have an answer to that ultimate question um, are also um, becoming better educated about how to resolve these tough problems that have, I think, come out of... Um, Frankly, all this national conversation about money. Well, you've expressed your concerns about functional parity, and I don't want to pit you against your uh, U.S. attorney, but his perspective, at least here in New Mexico, is that there's not a disparity as far as resources are concerned between prosecutors and or U.S. attorney's office and uh, the defenders. Do you um, take exception with that? Yeah, that's crazy talk. <laughs> that's, you know, they have so many resources. I mean, and, you know, and, and um, I mean, they, they've suffered, I mean, in fairness. And, and Damon, you know, Ms. Martinez is, is a wonderful U.S. attorney. He does a great job. Um, they've lost a lot of folks, uh, and they have trouble replacing them. Uh, they've lost a lot of folks to retirement, and, you know, people have moved to other districts. Um, and the caseload in New Mexico is, is crushing. I mean, it's, you know, we have the Indian country. We have the border. And so they, they do need more resources. But, you know, he, I think he's thinking of his office and not so much of the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, all, you know, the ICE, you know, all the, the support that they have. So, I mean, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, one-to-one, -one, I mean, their office is much larger than, than ours. They have like 30, 65 lawyers. We have 31. Uh, you know, they, and some of those are in the civil division, and some of those have special functions like national security, which we don't, you know, doesn't really come back on us much in terms of caseload. But I think overall, the Department of Justice, I don't think anyone even knows what their budget is. If you try to find it, it's all, you know, it's it's sort of classified or, or spread out over so many different um, different places um, that, you know, it, it's difficult to quantify. But on a local level, um, you know, uh, I, I think they're, they're okay. I mean, maybe he thought you guys could give him some more. <laughs> position. He brought that up. <laughs> Let me, if I may follow up. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. I just wanted to follow up on Judge Walton's point, uh, not just with the federal defenders, but especially with the panel attorneys. What about the resources for them? I mean, it seems to me that they don't have the resources that, that you have, nor DOJ. Would you care to comment on that? Yeah, they're at a distinct disadvantage. I agree, I agree with that. There's, yeah, they, um, unfortunately, um, you know, when I need a case investigated, I don't have to go ask for one. <laughs> I've got 10 investigators and paralegals in my office. When I've got a huge white collar fraud case, I've got an investigator that's accountant and a certified fraud examiner. I just hand her the case. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's simply no comparison. 
uh, really in the resources that are available to our office versus the CJA panel attorneys. Um, you know, a, t a telling example, one of the things that I, I, Mr. Martinez had testified to earlier when he was talking about the, the process of e-discovery. Um, this is a new ongoing phenomenon, especially in the Dallas division. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office is producing cases that leads to multiple terabytes of discovery, and they're handing it to solo practitioners and saying, here you go. And they simply can't handle that type of, uh, of case. Um, we're working on a solution to that um, uh, and trying to find and to, to create a, 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 a special server that will help with that process to make the footing more equal. Um, the, uh, a process that will allow my office to be appointed as a discovery coordinator um, and be able to house and host that discovery for the CJA panel attorneys on those cases. But yeah, I, I, I agree with Steve. Unfortunately, there are distinct disadvantages when it comes to us who are at a disadvantage when it comes to the U.S. Attorney's Office. How about getting experts? Um, and I would particularly talk to you, Ms. Grady, and you, Ms. Franco. Um, I know that in cases where I have, where I think they need an expert, they're not asking for them, or if they're trying to ask for them, they can't get people to fly in from Houston or Dallas or whatever. It's such a cost, and so it's hard to get them, hard to get them to come out for the cases. Um, and I and so I would like to hear your um, opinions about use of experts, particularly by the CJA attorney. I think it's extremely difficult for them, and if the court is regulating how um, how much the expert can charge and what they can pay for as far as flying in, um, because if we don't have any local talent in one of the Del Rio division or the El Paso division, they have to go out of town to get it. It's a, and it's very costly. I can tell you that firsthand from having approved the the vow, for our vouchers, but the uh, attorney request or the expert request from the attorneys, it's very um, very costly, and I. Honestly, I don't know how they do it um, because I think that even though the court would recognize that they needed an expert, one, they'd have to know to ask for it that the court would grant it, and then the court's hands are going to be tied as to how much money it can pay because of the caps that are that are in place. So it's extremely difficult. Um, that is a benefit that as a defender office that we have over um, court-appointed lawyers in these type of cases. It's part sticker shock. It's also... Um, <clears throat> part the mechanics of um, the difference in the mechanics of asking for an investigator or an expert let's say you need a psychiatrist and you're a panel attorney if it's an attorney in my office the attorney writes a memo to me or my first assistant explaining why they want the psychiatrist what the, you know what the case is about maybe we have some questions and then we approve it we find the psych the expert they've usually got somebody in mind and maybe we negotiate the fee a little bit imagine the attorney, the panel attorney, trying to do that um, with a court that is more interested than the court should be about why the panel attorney needs that expert. And maybe, from my perspective, we're hiring the expert to see what makes the person tick, you know, or to rule out what makes the person tick, you know, to, to identify or rule out something that might be an important mitigating um, factor. And sometimes it's not there. Well, that stays with us in the office. The panel attorney is in the difficult position of having to basically show his hand to the court um, with the request with the CJ, CJA 21. And, you know, I mean, some, some, sometimes we just don't know. We're not psychiatrists, so we don't know what exactly is wrong with our client, but something's going on and they want to know. Well, you can't explain that in your CJA 21 to the, to the court, so it's difficult. And I think that, that that dynamic discourages some panel attorneys from making the request in the first place. And in other situations, they make the request, but they don't make the case because they don't, they, they're limited in how much information that they want to disclose to the court uh, to support the, the, the funds, and they get, they get turned down. They don't go back. And maybe those are some of the cases where you, Judge Cardone, see, you wonder, well, you know, why didn't I see an expert on that case? Maybe it's because the panel attorney couldn't, like, articulate what was, what's the good reason, because sometimes we can't, because unlike, you know, I hate to admit it, but we're, I'm not an expert in all things. 
uh, even though sometimes I pretend to be. And, you know, but that's that's the, the process, and that's just the artificial weirdness of being a panel attorney and having to ask for an expert in a case when, frankly, you shouldn't be disclosing that kind of information in the first place. And based upon what you all have said, there are still several districts that don't have uh, federal defenders. Right. And, you know, some say, well, one fit doesn't, you know, apply to every situation. Should we be recommending that uh, all districts have federal defenders? Yes. Yeah, or a so. community, community defender. defender yeah. yeah. One or the other. Absolutely. Can't think of a good reason not to. Should be a hybrid system everywhere. Yeah, yeah along with CJ panel attorney representation and support. Absolutely. I have a question just as a follow-up on the experts issue. And when I was looking at the the national study or the national statistics about experts in CJA cases, I couldn't help but notice that in the Fifth Circuit, there are only 3% um, of the cases, of CJA cases, have experts. And the average, the average payment, if you will, per attorney on those expert cases, for the expert, is $90, which I'm not... I'm not really even sure what you can do with $90, but I guess it averages out for all the people who didn't ask for experts. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the question I have is whether or not you've actually heard from some of the folks on your CJA panel that this is an issue and as a result they just don't even bring the request or whether they've had a number of requests that have been denied or whether they're intimidated about it because they've been told before don't come in here with those silly requests for experts, or that case doesn't need an investigator. Um, I'm just trying to get an idea as to how it could possibly be so incredibly low, and then to have only $90 uh, as expert fees, because that that doesn't even buy you maybe an hour and a half for an investigator. Do you have any any ideas or any thoughts about that? I mean, from my perspective, I think you've highlighted all the problems, just anecdotally. I mean, I've heard those those types of complaints uh, from the CJ panel lawyers. I mean, I, I looked at the statistics for 2014, and there were 704 CJ representations, and in only 32 of those cases were experts used. And that's extraordinarily troubling to me. Um, I, I mean, frankly, my lawyers couldn't get by without the evidence investigators, my ability to hire psychologists and psychiatrists to do these, to help on these cases. Um, uh, I, you know, part of it is I wonder whether it's you know, training and not knowing the proper way to maybe ask for this. Um, I don't think in the past we may have emphasized that enough. Um, and especially after seeing these statistics, I mean, we're, we're going back to the drawing board and starting at square one. and. Part of our uh, presentation next year to the CJ panel is this is exactly how you get this done uh, from people that that have done it before. But I mean, like I said, we, I've heard anecdotal stories of judges just saying no, <laughs> just don't bring me this request. You want an investigator? Why can't you investigate it yourself? I concur with Jason and what you've you've said also too, um, Ms. Rowe, that about anecdotally it's the court will refuse it, that they're afraid to ask, they don't want to not get the next appointment because they asked for, you know, experts in this case or investigators in that case. But I also agree that perhaps we haven't done a great job of um, educating our panel that we take it as, you know, brushing your hair in the morning or something. I mean, it's just something natural that we would just do. And... Um, that you get an investigator, that you get an expert involved in a case. And um, I think that I agree with Jason that this year when we do our planning, that I will make sure that we, we address that issue and talk about it out front openly. <clears throat> Say, why aren't you asking for it? Do you, is it you know, a lack of knowledge and not knowing how to do it? Is it a lack of investigators that are available to do it? That could very well be the case that there is a lack of people locally that could do it. And so then there's the hesitancy of going outside of your – your division to get the expert, but um, I mean, I, I think that we probably should take some of the blame for that is that we have not done a good job of educating our panels that that, that is available to them. Well, I mean, you know, on that point, just, and I'll, I'll ask a question, but I do, I did want to comment about that because, you know, it's not just necessarily exclusively a training issue in terms of they don't know to do it, but it's also a cultural issue 
And it's about changing a culture of representation. You all come in a, from a culture where that is the way we do things. And, you know, it's well known that most panel lawyers are small, solo or small firm practitioners where it's not the culture to go hire an expert because, number one, your client doesn't have the money to go do it. And number two, if you're working in a state system, you won't get the funding, period. It's not even an option that's available. So uh, I wouldn't just, you know, I wouldn't just solely accept it as a failure of training by defenders, but but it's also something about the tra part of the training needs to be to change that culture. Um, it may be self-evident, but Steve, why don't you make the case for why you think that your model of moving from the anachronistic system of judges being the ones handling vouchers to the defender office uh, as being the way to go? Well, I, I think that experts is, is a good place to start with that. I mean, um, like all the other defenders here, I mean, I review expert requests every week, if not every day, from our lawyers, you know, for everything from a window tint expert in a highway stop case to a, uh, a neuropsychologist. And, um, you know, we, we see it every day. Um, we think it's, it's good practice. We think it's part of the practice. And I think that, um, I, I think it would be much less uh, discouraged, you know, either tacitly or, or uh, you know, unintentionally, um, or, or intentionally uh, by defenders who are performing that role, who are in, you know, saying, you know, look, if, if this was a, a defender case, you know, we'd be talking to this expert or that expert. I mean, we already do that informally, you know, because people call and say, you know, I mean, we, we have open lines of communication and, you know, you hear it every day in the office, you know, just, you know, there's a panel lawyer on line four and someone just picks up and talks and they'll, you know, they'll say, are they call their friends in the office and say, you know, we've got this kind of issue. Who do you like? Um, who would you hire? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think moving that to the next level where, where we have control um, over, over the purse strings, I think, would make it happen more often. And it, and it doesn't happen enough. I mean, it, it is sort of uh, a scandal in the federal system that the numbers are always low. I mean, they've been low ever since, you know, since I know that they've, they've been looked at. Terms of experts. Do, do you think that there could be a, a cost containment argument uh, or component of moving that function to defenders' involvement in, in experts for panel attorneys, either in terms of being able to know what is out there, know what rates are, or, or some other means, perhaps? You know, I, I think it would help. I mean, I think initially there may be more expenditures for experts if pe more people are using them. But honestly, um, you know, as Judge Armijo was saying, Chief Judge Armijo, you know, she's on our panel committee, and, and when we're talking about, you know, this lawyer is up for reappointment, I mean, she'll say, you know, he comes in and he has experts, and he, you know, or she has, you know, done this work, and, and you know, they, they really appreciate someone who goes out and does the work. So, you know, I, I think that there is kind of a disconnect there that you judges like to see that, but for some reason, people are too intimidated. I mean, I, I just think that um, it's it's a job that we're already doing for our own lawyers. Um, and I think, you know, all the studies have shown that we do it well, we do it efficiently, we do it um, with cost containment in, in mind. I mean, that's been the, the mantra that's, you know, come out of, come to us from Defender Services for years now, that you have to be responsible with the, with the public's money. Um, and I think, I think we're in a good position to do it. Like I say, we're already doing it. You know, we may need a little more help to do it for uh, the 130 lawyers on our panel, uh, in addition to the you know the 30 in our office, but I think it would it would improve the quality of practice and the quality of representation, and that's I think everyone's goal uh, in this in this endeavor. Now to the broader question of a voucher review, uh, why do you think that housing that function within the defender office um, would be a better approach than number one the current system and number two the possibility of some place else like the clerk's office? Well, again, because we're doing the work. I mean, you know, the people who are defenders have been selected by the circuit uh, or appointed by a board of directors, and they're experienced people. They, they know what it takes to defend a case. I mean, we've been doing it for decades. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we have a more open line of communication with the panel about, you know, why did this why is this voucher so high, or why is this so low, or why did this happen, or why did this not happen? What was the problem with this case? And I think um, that uh, I, I just think it would work better. I mean, like I say, I think you know we do that work every day, 
Um, and, you know, and we know the panel lawyers. I mean, we have co-defendants with them. We, you know, we see them in court when there's a big docket. Um, you know, we talk to them about their cases and what's going on. And so, um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the good things about the judges doing it in the sense that they know the case, they've, you know, they've sat through a trial or a hearing or whatever, um, those, that benefit transfers pretty easily to the defenders, you know, especially if we're involved all along in terms of a budget or experts or um, just, you know, help on, on hearings. I mean, we do moot courts for people. We do, you know, uh, we give briefs. We share, you know, motions and, and substantive things like that all the time. So, you know, there's already a lot of involvement, a lot of crossover with the panel. I know that's not a unanimously held position and within the defender community. Is there anybody else on the panel who uh, disagrees with Steve's view and if so, could make the counterpoint to why it's not a good idea to have that function within the defender office? Well, Steve's looking at me and he kind of ratted me out <laughs> at the beginning of it. But you know, I have to say, when I became the Pretty first positive. assistant, um, when I became the first assistant, Henry Bemperod was the defender. Um, my first um, big defender conference that I went to with him, I said, we should be doing this. We should take that from the court. We should review the vouchers. We should, you know, help with that. He's like, you're crazy, you know, with the <laughs> workload that we have. And he's like, you go to it. Go see if you can figure that out. And, of course, then he just gave me a bunch of other work to do. So I never got around to it. But, I mean, I think that ideally it should be in our office. It's just, I, I would, you know, we need help. It can't be done under the current system. And um, we would just need to have a lot more. The staff that the work measurement gave me is just barely to keep us going where we are right now. But uh, philosophically, I'm right with Steve. I mean, I think that our offices should be doing it. Um, our compadres that do it throughout the country um, swear by it and think it's the best way to do it. And I think that I'm convinced that it is the best way to do it. We, we do not manage the panel, Chip, as you know, but um, but... Uh, there's a lot to be said for a long-term plan to have defender organizations manage their panels. There's a lot of um, offices, I think, who might agree with, uh, with us on the um, purpose of panel management and the cost-saving cost component of panel management, and there is one. Um, but maybe they don't have either the funds, it's not built into their formulas, how is it counted, or they don't have the space to do it. And frankly, to, to manage a panel, and based upon my conversations with my colleagues who do manage panel, it, it, it takes more than one person to do it. And a lot of the courts only have one person assigned, and that person isn't an attorney and doesn't have the, the background or experience to appreciate the paperwork that's coming in. So, you know, uh, it, but if I could just add one thing to what Steve was saying, and I'm in full agreement with what he said, there, you know, just take the example of, um, of uh, ret retaining an expert to work on a case. Sometimes that's, that can be beneficially a truncated process. It, it, you know, we, maybe you, you're, you want to bring the expert in to identify whether or not there is an issue for the expert to then investigate but we do not know whether that issue is even there. So we, we retain the expert to first identify whether the issue that we're thinking about exists and whether the expert should go forward. That's a small price tag. Then having identified, yes, that issue does seem to be there, perhaps your client does in fact have uh, um, delusional disorder and what I've seen suggests, yes, that's there, we go forward with a separate contract. I can't, I don't think that's happening in the context of panel attorneys where they're, it's just not invited by the way the system is set up, um, where they can actually in, bring the expert in, investigate whether the question should be pursued, and then having perhaps reached a positive response, then going, hiring the expert to then pursue the, develop the question. So, or the answer to the question. So those are, th those are things that we do on a regular basis as defenders as a cost-saving um, component to our daily practice that just isn't worked into the, the model to the extent that there is one for panel attorneys that we would do if, the panel, if we had panel administrators in our offices. Does anybody perceive um, uh, there to be a conflict in that role or... I've often heard that as a concern for some defenders who don't believe it's appropriate to uh, 
to exercise that function. D does anybody share that position or there, maybe? Sure, there, there are going to be some cases where it's a problem. I mean, I think uh, current system you know, has some issues that way. Um, defenders who do it, like, like Susan Otto was saying, uh, I think that, that there, there are ways to insulate that person and that position um, so that you know, there isn't there isn't any kind of compromise on the um, duties of confidentiality and, and uh, you know, the other problems that would come up in that scenario. Um, I mean, I, I think it's manageable. I mean, it, it is, you know, it is something that has to be thought about. I think I probably know what your response is going to be, but as you know, there's been a push by the Justice Department and some in Congress for federal courts to create reentry courts. And uh, they're, va they're extremely labor intensive and the responsibility in those courts I'm familiar with, as far as defense services are concerned, they have to take over representation of defendants, even if they were hired or represented by someone else uh, for the reentry re court program. If your chief judge decided that he or she wanted to create a reentry court, would you have the resources to staff the court? We have a reentry court in the El Paso division. So, and I staff it. I have um, three other assistants uh, that assist me with it. Um, so, we do have a reentry court. So, I could do one. That's about it, though. I mean, it would require because they are extremely labor intensive. That's why I had other assistants. I was trying just to do it myself, but it became clear that. It required a lot of work, and so I've um, got volunteers to help me with it. But I, personally, philosophically, I think reentry courts are, um, and I've seen the proof is in the pudding. I see that it works um, if you do it right. Uh, that I think that it's, it's worth the investment, but it it is very labor intensive. To and do we it. also we also have a reentry court in Dallas. Also, it was started by United States Magistrate Judge Irma Ramirez, and we staff it with one of our attorneys who will go over um, on a monthly basis. Uh, to help out with those cases, um, I would agree that uh, you know I've been in there and watched it several times. Um, I think it's transformed the lives of some of the people that are in there um, uh, and has prevented them from from recidivating. And so, I, I think it's definitely worth the effort on the part of the judiciary to introduce more of those types of courts into the federal in the federal system. I have a, a question. Um, Mr. Martinez, when he was here, was talking about um, the way his office functions, and you guys were all talking about parity. And um, as a result of Mr. Friendsley's question, talking about you know some sort of overseeing of the CJA panel, um, what if um, we came up w and then talking about independence? What if we came up with some formula uh, or some system that essentially gave you were each federal public defenders selected by your circuit. Um, and with the help of the DSO, each of you were given a budget, like Mr. Martinez is given, to oversee defense in your district. And that would include overseeing the CJA panel, overseeing um, your FPD office, um, making sure that experts were available across the board for everybody. How, how do you see that functioning, um, where you, you're given a chunk of money, just like Mr. Martinez, make things fair, um, you know, and then with the help of DSO and, and, you know, formulas and things that help you figure out how to spend that money. Is that something that might work? Any thoughts? Um, never thought about that. I mean, I, I think that that's happening on a macro level. I mean, the, you know, Defender Services has, um, they have a pretty tight reign on CJA panel payments. I mean, back during sequestration, they could tell us, um, you know, what they were spending per day on vouchers. So, I mean, I, I think the expertise is there. Um, you know, it, it probably could work. I, I think part of what uh, Mr. Martinez was talking about was I think um, they'd like to have more input um, on who gets to stay on the panel. And, um, you know, in, in theory, I don't, you know, I guess in theory, I have a problem with it in, in you know, having the U.S. attorney have some say over who gets to be on the panel. In practice, I think it, it would work in our district with the personalities we have now. Um, because I get calls from assistant U.S. attorneys, um, you know, 
fairly regularly saying like, hey, you know, what is up with this lawyer? Why are they not returning my calls? They're not doing anything for these clients. You know, they're letting this, this offer lapse when it's, you know, it's really in the client's best interest. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that they would, they would not say this guy's uh, a pain in our side and so we don't want him on the panel. It would be more like, hey, this person's really not doing their job and I don't feel good about uh, winning the case when, when they're just laying down. Um, well, and what I'm talking about is you managing it. Right. In other words, as FPD, you, if you're getting those calls anyway, why shouldn't you sort of over be overseeing that whole system yeah. in your district? It's or a big job. I mean, that would that would like I said, I already have a job. I mean, well, just but like, but with, with more staff, with yeah. a budgeting attorney, I mean, is there a way that you think it could happen? As I, I think it could, and I think it does happen in some of the smaller districts. Um, I, I think in the district of um, Columbia, AJ, uh, uh, AJ Kramer, Kramer, you know, does that, you know, um, pretty much in, in New Orleans. I think that uh, the defender there uh, has serves that function pretty much already. I mean, not they don't we don't have fiscal control because the the payments go through defender services. But um, you know, I mean, I, I think those are the people to ask. I mean, and I don't know how it would work on on a scale um, like we have in the in the border. It's the, the numbers are just staggering. I mean, South Texas, uh, they have 25,000 cases a year just in the Defender Office. So, I mean, the, the, the scale would be daunting in those kind of situations. But it does happen uh, on a smaller scale. So, I mean, there certainly is precedent for that. Anybody else? Any thoughts? I mean, yeah, the, the scale thing intimidates me, frankly. Um, I, I don't know what kind of staff that would necessarily take to get something like that done, and so that that would require a great deal of thought. And I'd really have to look at the numbers of you know whether we could handle something like that with our current caseload as high as it is. I mean, I, I think it makes sense to do it that way. It's just um, the logistics trying to figure those out, but it does seem to be a solution to this problem. I think short term for some of us, it can be done. Longer term for others. But yes, I mean, as a basic concept, I think it could be done. It's you're basically building a little office within an office to manage the panel. Um, I wanted to ask in the circuit, uh, particularly in the Fifth Circuit, uh, a question about the two. There isn't one. I know that in the Western District, I think we have four death penalty cases that we just got um, with no attorneys really available to uh, appoint to represent. and so. Um, Ms. Franco, and I, uh, and for you, Mr. Hawkins, if, if you have any input on this, how do you feel about these capital habeas cases, and how do you assist your judges in finding counsel for them? It was a, a real um, disheartening experience to be involved um, with you and the other judges trying to find counsel for um, these death cases. Um, the fact that we don't have a capital unit in Texas um, is devastating that there are lawyers out there who can do this work and are able to do this work, but they're overworked because Texas likes to execute people. So they are busy working on that, uh, on the cases, the current cases that they have. After the Martinez decision, a, the person who represented them in state court should not be representing them in the federal proceeding. Um, and so that's, of, when I heard that earlier today, that is of concern because there should be a new uh, set of eyes or a couple of pairs of eyes that are put on those cases. And um, I think that I, I don't understand what the hesitancy is. I don't understand the entire history as to why we can't even say the word chew in, in Texas but before the circuit. But um, Jason was offering to, to house one. Um, all the defenders in Texas agreed that um, would we'd send our cases there, that Jason could manage that office. And we were shot down um, by the circuit at a very low level, but um, we were basically told, what was it? That we'd have a better chance of reforming Social Security than getting a, a capital habeas unit in Texas. Um, so, I, you know, the alternative approach is what Virginia is doing, which is, hiring people in our office that could do that work. But with the caseload as it is right now, unless I get that cap up, I can't do that. But ideally, that's what I would like to do is to add um, a couple of attorneys. I recently hired a mitigation specialist, so putting my big toe in the water to try to at least get ready to do these type of cases. But it might be that's what we're going to have to do if we're able to raise our caps that we should 
perhaps consider um, recognizing that this is a need in the state of Texas, that it's not going to be changed institutionally, and so each defender needs to take on that responsibility. Was any explanation given as to why the circuit took that position in light of the fact that Texas executes more people than anybody? No, sir. Never your honor. I have a question about the, the panel, if, if after that moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, before the um, CJA, over 50 years ago, uh, judges routinely picked out someone in the courtroom. You there, sir, you look like a fine lawyer. Why don't you represent this man? Oh, you're a real estate lawyer? Oh, well, that's not a problem in, in federal criminal cases. And we all know that. And there came a time when that became disfavored. and the courts decided that it was not the best representation to bring someone in who knew nothing about federal criminal defense and assign them to someone who was looking at 20, 30 years in prison. I'm wondering, I, uh, Mr. Hawkins, when I read your, uh, your statement for today, I was very surprised to see that in the District of Texas, and I'm wondering if it, it's also true of any other districts, that there were six divisions in the Northern District in which there's something called a non-voluntary panel in that if you are a lawyer and you're breathing and walking that you can do federal criminal cases where someone can get a 15-year mandatory minimum just because you didn't understand the difference between what a predicate offense was for ACCA and what it wasn't. Do you tell me about that and why you think that exists and also for the other folks on the panel whether or not that's an issue in your district? Well, you know, why it exists, I mean, it generally um, exists in, in divisions where there's a fairly low lawyer population. I mean, let's face it, I mean, I've, got, I've got some counties in Texas where there are more cattle than there are people. So it's difficult in finding, you know, uh, lawyers to do the cases. And so uh, do, do I think it's proper? No. Um, uh, you know, when, when a lawyer is appointed on those cases, I mean, do they frequently coordinate with us? Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, we're, we're currently shepherding through a case of a lawyer in Amarillo that um, only practices tax law and has no, no, no real experience in doing these types of cases. And it's unfortunate, but there's just, there's, there's just not a large panel in, in Amarillo to, to, to get that done at one at all. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just just been the historical practice, and um, from judges that have been on the bench, for frankly, a very long time. And they're, um, you know, it's certainly been broached before um, uh, by, you know, my predecessor certainly, um, and it's, it just hasn't moved the needle at all. Um, and I, I think it's just it, it's just always been that way, and so that's the way they view that it always should be. Do they have a CJA plan? Uh, yes, there's a CJA plan for the Northern District of Texas. No, but does do, do the and, and do, are they following that plan then? Um, uh, yeah, Your Honor, um, our recently the AO came down and did a study of our CJA plan and the, and the quality of representation um, within the Northern District of Texas. Um, I would, they were very, um, they highly praised uh, my particular office. They were. Um, very critical of how the CJA plan is run um, out, you know, in some of these divisions. Um, and so there has been a movement um, by myself, uh, along with our district clerk and our chief district judge, to see if we can find a way to revise that plan. Um, but that's just in its beginning stages. Is there any sense of if somebody's not following the plan, what can be done? I mean, why have a plan if nobody's following? I, that, that's a difficult question to answer, Your Honor. I mean, I, um, I, I would say that each, you know, federal judge um, has its own views on how the panel should be run. And there's, you know, the chief district judge certainly doesn't have the ability necessarily to control the other, the other district judges in this matter. It's been my experience from what I've noticed. I've never heard of anything like that. I mean, you certainly don't have that in New Mexico. I mean, although the uh, some of our senior judges talk 
fondly of the days when they would be summoned in to sit in the jury box as young associates and they would be assigned a case pro bono. Um, but I don't think anyone thinks that's a good idea. We have a great panel. I mean, I'm proud of our panel. We have some amazing lawyers on the panel. Um, I'd be more than happy to have them represent me or any member of my family. Um, and I think, you know, that's the way it should be. We had that problem in the Austin division, which I alluded to earlier. Um, our office gets the majority of cases, anywhere between 85 to 90 percent of the cases. But um, one would think that there's plenty of qualified lawyers in, in Austin, Texas, who could do criminal defense work. Um, but they have, um, at this point, even though uh, several defenders, um, well, my two predecessors, attempted to get Austin to develop a plan or adopt a plan, they have not um, and still have not. And so for us to do training, um, I have to rely on the clerk's office to let me know who had um, filed a voucher within the last year or 18 months, two years. And then we email those people so that they could come in for some training. So I have no idea um, who a lot of them are. Um, but it's not from a lack of trying, and it's from my end and also from John Convery, who's the the rep for the Western District and the, and the Fifth Circuit rep um, in Austin trying to get them to adopt a plan and set up a panel, but they have, at this to this point, have refused to do it. Well, what's the reluctance? I think it's partly the idea of picking someone out of the office, uh, audience to uh, represent a client or picking up the phone and calling somebody um, to do it, but what Jason is saying happens with us too. If a lawyer who's never done, who's only a civil lawyer and has never done criminal work, the first thing they do is they call the branch chief in Austin and, and our office will help walk that person through the case. It becomes very problematic though if we have a co-defendant because then we can't offer that assistance because of the privilege and confidentiality issues. So are you saying that it's the court's decision not to develop a plan? Apparently. Or follow Right, because we plan. have a district plan. So even if they follow the district plan, but they don't have a divisional plan. But attorneys are still willing to do the work if they're called by the judge. Well, only 10% of them, because we, I mean, to the Austin Division's credit to those judges there, they are giving the majority of the cases to us, but that does not promote the idea of having a robust hybrid system, which is what we need. And so we need to have more than just the defender's office representing um, individuals who are charged in that division. Is there any, I'm sorry, is oh, there no. any reason to believe that that the Austin attorneys don't want to be on the panel because of, uh, because of any voucher cut issues or uh, lack of independence or, or any of those issues? Possibly. Or is, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, no, and I was just going to say, it's been my experience, especially in the smaller divisions, when a federal judge calls, you're not going to say no. Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned, Ms. Grady, that you said uh, we all have lines in the sand. I'd like each of you to tell us what your lines, line or lines in the sand are. We'll start with you, Mr. McHugh. For us, for us as a committee. What are your major lines in the sand? Um, you know, I, I, I think in increasing or decreasing the independence of our office. I mean, being able uh, to decide who gets cases within our office, um, how we staff them, how we fund them within our office. And I mean, to, to me, that's, that's a line that um, I've drawn in the sand with the district court. I mean, I, you know, we, we don't let them pick lawyers. Um, we don't let, let them, you know, basically tell us how to do things in terms of funding our cases. So I would say that, that that's sort of a hard line that we've drawn. And, you know, in, and if we could move that to protecting the panel, um, then I think that that would be something that I would be all for. Um, I, I think, like I said before, the the panel's really the, the canary in the coal mine because they're the independent contractors, they're solo, um, they don't have the, the strength in numbers that we do, and so I think, um, you know, they're the ones who um, suffer the most when uh, there's a scarcity mentality, you know, abroad in the judiciary. 
For me, um, it's the independence of our um, IT function. Um, it has just become critically apparent to me that if we don't ha we don't get this solved quickly and affirmatively and definitively, then every Defender office, I would recommend that they um, get their own server and they work their own uh, email system, their own Defender data system, their own statistical um, recording, because if there is a third party that has access to our information, it completely destroys the attorney-client privilege and it, assist, it, it makes us all susceptible to being grieved upon by our clients because we'd have to get all former clients, all um, present uh, clients to agree to that breach, that potential breach. And so um, to restore that um, independence in our IT function, I think is for me is a very hard line in the sand that um, we really need for that to happen. The other is, is that the demotion of the Defender Services within the AO, that needs to be reversed. Um, she, whoever's in the position, uh, obviously I'm saying she because Kay Clark's in that position, but she should be moved out of the program services and restored to the directorate position that she had before to show that we are not ju just providing or simply <coughs> providing services to the courts, to the judges, is that we represent clients, real individuals, that have been charged with crimes, and so we're not like probation and pretrial um, in the clerk's office. We're different, um, and so I think she needs to be restored, or that position needs to be restored. But for me, those are the two hard lines in the sand that that I've drawn. Great. Well, I guess we're a duet. Um, <laughs> let me just add that um, you know having a memorandum of understanding um, on the subject of um, uh, AO access to our case management data is not sufficient. You know, we don't pass that around and require people to eat it, to re read it in the lunchroom. Um, people don't understand it. I don't understand why we have one. Frankly, it's no substitute for what ought to be physical separation of our data management. It's what private attorneys would have. They have it. I can imagine being a private attorney and being told, by the way, we're just going to hook you up. Don't worry about it. Here's a, mem a, mem a memorandum of understanding to make up for that hookup. Um, I think that's a real problem, and it really um, undermines um, uh, confidence in the integrity of our um, of our case management. Um, and the other, and I agree, put DSO back where it was, and see where we go with that. That's a simple solution. Maybe it was made. I I don't know under the stress of the financial times, but I think it was a bad idea and we need to put it back where it was. Yeah, at, building on that, at a bare minimum, the demotion of our the Defender Services Program within the structure of the AO is absolutely unacceptable to me. Um, and the fact that we don't have a seat at the table in requesting appropriations for our office, um, it is, became readily apparent to me during sequestration that we can do just as good a job or better than policymakers within the uh, within the AO did in that crucial time. Um, I think the policy decisions are being made within the administrative office by people that have never stepped foot in a courtroom or never defended a federal criminal case. And so we, the office needs to be restored to allow us to have a seat at the table. One of the um, <clears throat> concerns in the community of panel attorneys is the issue of uh, unwarranted and arbitrary voucher cutting. And I'm just curious because um, one of the things that's readily apparent is that there's just a complete absence of data um, to support or show the prevalence of that condition. And I'm wondering what you know about that, if anything, in your districts. Well, in Colorado, we can only give you anecdotal evidence because we don't have access to the data. But uh, if we did, we'd be talking about it. Um, I, I can tell you that it happens, it seems to anecdotally be happening more than it used to. Sometimes it goes in waves, um, but uh, largely it's happening not just at the tail end of the case with the voucher, but also at the front end with the request on the CJA 21s. And, and it's my understanding, and I, I may have misunderstood this, but the e-vouchering program um, was supposed to identify those cases, uh, initially at least, where the judges were cutting the vouchers, and that has since been disabled. Is this just a, across the board, or are you talking about specific judges? 
I mean, is it universal? No, it is it not just... universal. It's, it's the same in New Mexico. I mean, there are, I mean, I've had a lot of lawyers call me up and say, you know, I've been on the panel for 20 years and I've never had a voucher cut and all of a sudden I'm getting these cuts and there's no, you know, the only explanation is like, that's, that's just too much money for that kind of case. Uh, it's not that they didn't do the work. It's not that the work wasn't reasonable. It's just too much money. And so I've heard that more in the last few years than I ever heard it previously. So I, I, it's a problem. That's all I can tell you. I, and I think, I mean, there was supposed to be the ability to see the voucher as submitted any voucher and then the voucher as paid. <clears throat> and so I think that, you know, I don't know if that's, if that's been disabled, then that's, it's, it's hard to track. I mean, the, the CJA lawyers are at a real disadvantage. I mean, they don't want to complain. They, they view it as throwing good money after bad. You know, that, that you know, they're not going to get paid for the time that they spend uh, meeting with the judge about the, the cut that was made. I mean, we encourage them to do that. Some lawyers do it. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think they should all do it. Um, but, you know, they worry about the, where the next case is coming from, and they worry about uh, like I say, just you know, throwing good money after bad so they don't pursue it. Again, is that with specific judges or universal? Um, I, I, it's specific judges, some more than others. Is it coming from the presiding judge, the court of appeals, both? It's the, the individual judges, the individual district judges. Is that everyone's uh, thought that it's more district court judge than a court of appeals in your districts? Well, I think there's cutting being done up there, too. Yes, De yeah, definitely with regard to some of the capital habeas cases of, you know, seeking cuts, and so absolutely. Right. Do any of you have the ability to ascertain when bill when vouchers are cut? No. 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 And so none of you then obviously notify your judges for them to know. There was a judge from your district, I think. I'm not sure if it was, it was yours, Mr. McHugh, now I'm, I can't remember, but one of your districts was saying, that they never knew when vouchers were cut. It was your district, actually. And the question was, why Why wouldn't they? But it's because you don't even know. The federal defender never gets notified. No. But the reason I ask that question is because in districts where the federal defender manages the panel, the federal defender knows every voucher that's cut and then sends a letter to the district court judge also saying that the voucher's been cut, hmm. but was cut at the circuit. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, I don't think they know in our district. Do you have any feelings for or thoughts about whether or not there are um, there's a practice in your district that the panel attorneys voluntarily cut their own vouchers oh, yeah. in order to prevent the d vouchers from getting cut again? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, they do. Absolutely. I mean, and I think a lot of I mean, what I always encourage people to do is to list the hours, but you know, reduce the claim so that the judge knows that you know there was a lot more time put into this than they're, than they're billing the court for. But yeah, no, people do that. It was interesting, um, the comments of a, the, a judge that was on the first panel, when he kept saying that he had no problems, he never had any problems with voucher cuts from your district, Ms. Franco. And um, I think that issue became clear, or the reason he ne never had any problems became clear is because all the lawyers were getting their um, vouchers under the statutory maximum number. Mm -hmm. So that couldn't have been a coincidence. Right. One would think not. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't mean to leave the the expert. Uh, I know we we haven't talked about it in a minute in a while, but um, with respect to um, compensation for for expert services, are other than the statutory caps that exist, are you aware of any artificially created caps on expert services that are happening in your districts or circuits? As far as, you know, the court saying, you know, this is the cap, no matter what, you're never going to spend more money than this on any experts. Well, there, there's a CJA manual that the clerk's office publishes that has presumptive rates. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I've, I've never heard of them saying, you know, that, that that's, uh, that's, you know, that's it. We're not going to go over that. I think if you have a good reason um, and, you know, you can show that there's good quality work being done, that that, that you know, that's just something the clerk's office puts out. It's not, the judges aren't bound by it. I would agree with that. That there's that chart that shows a presumption, except for mental health, I think that's excluded for it. For it. But there's a presumptive rate. Um, but um, 
we've made it clear, and I think a year or two ago when we had a CJA training in the El Paso division that, and maybe you participated, Judge Cardone, I don't remember, but where uh, we told the panel that that's a presumptive rate, that if you have fine an expert that requires more, that you could ask the court for it, um, for more than just what the presumptive rate was. But, um, you know, I think it's judge specific and also the pr practitioner who they find the, to do the work for them. Do you have a question? Yeah, I actually had a question I'd like to, if, if Jason could could explain something to me. I understand that you have a, currently, and I'm only asking you to talk about publicly available information, but a 2255 in your office involving a federal capital prosecution in Texas in which uh, the initial budget, which was a fairly small budget approved by the district court judge, was, I understand, slashed by the circuit court. Um, and that became an issue of contention. Are you able to tell us what the publicly available facts on that are, or are there any? I, I no. I mean, I think, think that's still. My understanding is that's still under review. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with that, that, that with that particular case. Have you or Maureen heard of that happening in any other cases, federal capital cases in this circuit? <coughs> Yes. <laughs> we take anonymous comments. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, we're getting close to the end. Um, I, is there anything, um, let's start with you, Mr. McHugh, anything that you would like to add um, to, that we have overlooked or that you think is important for us? To do? No, I'm, I'm, I've said my piece. Thank you. Maureen. No, Your Honor, thank you. Yeah, for me, thank you. Uh, if I could just go back to the one thing on the capital habeas unit, Your Honor. Um, I, I think it is important to try to get some type of, you know, if not a unit, some type of lawyers that are familiar with that work established somewhere in the state of Texas. And frankly, I don't think that that can come from me. I don't think it can come from Maureen. I think that that charge has got to be led by the district judges and the magistrate judges that are having difficulty um, uh, in finding lawyers to do these cases. So I think if your voices are, are loudly heard at the Fifth Circuit, that that's going to be having a much greater impact than it is on, on just me asking the way to be established. Well, on behalf of the committee, uh, we want to thank you again um, all for being here. Um, yeah, as you know, we're going to be resuming tomorrow morning early. We would invite all of you to be here uh, to continue to hear and listen. And again, we take, uh, I've said this before, we have cjstudy.fd.org for all of you in the audience, for people that want to follow up. If you have any thoughts, any great epiphanies on how we can go forward, please do not hesitate because we are trying to get as many ideas and um, to, to really uh, put as much work and effort into this as we can. So as you can see, uh, we would appreciate any comments. And thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.